so yeah they have a legal right and i don't think the the hebrews knew but god if they follow god's direction he was setting them up for success and and they might not have known the reasons why he commanded those things but it was a if they didn't get destroyed if they didn't get out of the camp those demonic uh entities that were tied to the idols and the altar and all that stuff they had legal right you could do all the praying you want they're not going to go it needed to be destroyed uh to break that because yes there was going to be a uh, an influence and an, an evil influence on the people in that land in that camp in that surrounding area wherever those artifacts the altar the idols were that was going to be a curse to them Welcome to the Days of Noah podcast, where we talk all things biblical, supernatural, and strange. My name is Pete. My brother Luke and I are going to discuss the Canaanite altars, an interview with Tim Bentz done by Rob Skiba maybe about a decade ago. Now, Tim is an intercessor of the Lord who was dealing with these ancient Canaanite Nephilim altars around the world. And it's really just fascinating to see how the Genesis 6 event, the sin of the Watchers, and their progeny, the Nephilim, continues to affect the world. Hey, I yeah. guess we're doing this. Yeah, brother. How are you? I'm good. Excellent. Did you have a chance to listen to the Tim Bentz interview or get familiar with it? Yeah, I thought it was excellent. Very impressed. I don't think I've heard him speak. So yeah, hearing the details of Jekyll Island and uh, how the Lord led him there and everything and the previous uh, testimony was pretty cool. Yeah, it's something I had come across many years ago because I had gotten into things from Rob Skiba. I was a fan of, of his stuff. And what's cool about Rob is... is uh, and poor guy passed away during covid um don't okay, know i didn't know that yeah and he was only i think in his 40s maybe um yeah another casualty of that wasn't because wasn't doug riggs wasn't that didn't he get sick during that same time yeah and uh russ Dizdar and his wife wow yeah so the world lost a lot of awesome uh leaders yeah a lot of wisdom yeah. But yeah, what's cool about Rob is like, from my understanding, he never had like a credentialed kind of scholarly, you know, background, but he was just more of a, just a passionate lay leader, like a researcher that just kind of blazed his own path. And then he ends up, you know, teaching at seminars and conferences and stuff like that, because he, he digs into all these weird topics. Yeah, I haven't done any research on him at all. Um, and the Tim Bentz, I think the first time I heard his name was when Dr. Laura Sanger um, brought him up in 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 her research dealing with Jekyll Island. So, um, so she heard the very same interview that we're going to be talking about. That's that's what set her on her journey, which was really cool. Yeah, so um, I I kind of went ahead be- because I think we'll probably get into it in the next couple weeks. But I went ahead and and revisited her blurry creatures episodes uh, where she was a guest, and um, there's two of them that are back to back, and that's how she said she got into this whole topic of Nephilim and the Federal Reserve that she wrote a book about. Was that right? That, that very interview that we're going to talk about today. So. That's really cool. And I don't know when this uh, conversation took place. Um, the YouTube says five years ago. Um, I think it was further because I think in that conversation was around the time or shortly after the, the recession, uh, 08, 09. 
Yep. My guess is like 2014, something in there. Yeah, so let's get into that. So um, Tim Bentz doing an interview with Rob Skiba, and we're estimating maybe 10 years ago, talking about Nephilim altars and how he dealt with those spiritually and the, the, the way as, a, as an intercessor of the Lord he was led to deal with these things. So he starts his story talking about uh, some of the things that he was dealing with spiritually over in, I guess, the Middle East. Um, and he, he talks about, um, God revealing to him these Canaanite altars and how he was able to deal with them spiritually and break them, sometimes physically, sometimes spiritually breaking them so that they didn't have power anymore. Um, and apparently that this is... These are altars that were not dealt with properly. Um, and he gets into that in the interview about how if if we had dealt with these altars properly, um, we probably wouldn't be having these issues today. Because uh, Israel was given very specific instructions how to deal with these things. So one of the points he, he mentions is um, just a spiritual binding over people due to legal access in the spiritual world. In this case, it was due to an ancient item of Nephilim iniquity, these altars. Um, and I, I, I have in my notes here just to mention about uh, Laura Sanger's Nephilim traits that, that she talks about. And she's got a whole list of specific um, traits or qualities that where she calls it kind of a Nephilim host where you're basically in line. You might not genetically have Nephilim traits, but you may be involved in a sinful pattern that makes you aligned with that type of uh, objective, I guess. Yeah, um, a willing per- participant. I would right. uh, maybe describe it as. So it's it's your, your will, your actions... Um, that are lining up with, uh, it's, it's really, it's the, it's the sin that you're willing to commit mm-hmm. and the lines you're willing to cross that, and, and, and which we know is opening yourself up to, to uh, demonic activity. And maybe these individuals know they're opening themselves up um, and they're desiring more power, demonic power, or, um, Maybe they're not really understanding it all, but they're still willing to uh, engage in these things. And then, yeah, we see the byproducts or the the the, the reaping of what they sown, um, even generations later. Right. Yeah, and um, she outlines four specific um, iniquities that can have a defilement of the land. And so she calls it spiritual mapping where um, she has been able to connect with people who have a gift of discernment where they're able to um, have kind of a word of knowledge from from God about a a particular geographic region in order to discern what type of um, defilement has happened on the land that continues to affect the people in that region to this day. And if I can recall off the top of my head those four things, there was uh, idolatry, there was, um, I think, like a sexual perversion, there was uh, breaking of covenant, and then there was like... um, like violence in terms of blood sacrifice, that kind of thing. Would that be in her book um, under maybe the chapter classification as a Nephilim host? So I think the Nephilim host traits are more broad than that. This was, this was, um, and she goes in the detail on that uh, in the, in the interview with uh, blurry creatures hosts, but I believe the spiritual mapping had to do with these four particular areas that had to do with a defilement of the land. 
Um, the Nephilim host traits are more broad. There's more than four. And she does have a subsection where there's like, I think maybe five or six that are really serious, like kind of the ones I just mentioned, where she says if, if you have any two of those, then you are considered being a Nephilim host. And then she has kind of maybe lesser lesser important ones where if you have any four, I think she said. Um, we'll save that for another time because I don't have that list in front of me. But yeah, you're you're on the right track there. That's that's what she's identifying. So yeah, so in this uh, course of events, there were archaeologists who were uh, working overseas in Middle East area, I believe, and. Uh, Tim Bentz got connected with them, and they said, hey, we've discovered what looks like an altar, and this was in like a known Canaanite city over there. Um, and I want to just look up real quick how God said to deal with these altars um, as he's bringing his people into the promised land and dealing with these Nephilim tribes. So in Deuteronomy 7... Uh, It's about driving out the nations. It says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Okay, those are all Nephilim infiltrated or or humans uh, willing to mate and breed with uh, Nephilim. Seven nations larger and stronger than you, And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. So that's the harem. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, burn their idols in the fire. And later on it says in the same chapter, uh, The images of their gods you are to burn in the fire. Do not covet the silver and gold on them, and do not take it for yourselves or you will be ensnared by it. And I think what's interesting there is not only is God being very practical and saying, hey, this this will be a temptation if you, you know, take this little gold statue that you will be wanting to worship it. But as we've talked about, you know, spiritual demonic forces can inhabit these things. And so I wonder too if it's if God's like preventing his people from being ensnared that way. Like not the temptation to necessarily worship it, but well, that plus um, the idea of of these things being able to have influence, right? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, they have a legal right, and I don't think the the Hebrews knew, but God, if they follow God's direction, um, he was he was. Um, he was setting them up for success and, and they might not have known the reasons why he commanded those things, but it was a, if they didn't get destroyed, if they didn't get out of the camp, those demonic uh, entities that were tied to uh, the idols and the altar and all that stuff, they had legal right. You could do all the praying you want, you know, and they're not going to go. Um, that it needed to be destroyed uh, to break that because yes, there was going to be uh, an influence and an, an evil influence on the people in that land, in that camp, in that surrounding area, wherever those artifacts, the altar, the idols were, that was going to be a curse to them. Right. What's that? There's a there's a particular story where where someone in Israel did that. Do you, do you recall they they brought it back in their tent and then they had curses on them they lost battles or something and then it came to light that this person brought that thing back do you remember that story 
Uh, I'd have to double check, but I'm thinking it might have been Jericho. Um, something that was supposed to have been uh, eradicated completely, um, but then was was taken into the camp, probably because they coveted the gold that was on the statue. Um, it might have been Jericho, but um, yeah, I do remember that story. Well, and even um, even with uh, was it Jacob? Rachel um, took back something like Laban's house gods or something. She took back into her tent, and he goes, "Oh, well, whoever did that needs to die." And she ended up dying in childbirth after that so his his wor- his words pronounced a curse on her and she, and he didn't even know it was her at the time yeah i vaguely remember that story and i'm i'm also thinking of another one where they were they they went into a a, a new territory the israelites did so they're inhabiting homes and dwellings of of another nation pro- if, lineage of the the nephilim where they're serving other pagan gods and um there was something described like um uh almost like this i want to say red or green it was basically it was something that was going to appear on the walls that if if you resided in this in this dwelling place there was going to be a sign, a supernatural sign that something was uh, on the property that needed to be cleansed. And if you saw those certain things, you were supposed to go to the priest. The priest was going to go and they were basically going to systematically cleanse the property. And if necessary, tear down the walls, tear down the foundation, find those artifacts that are defiling that property that you're inhabiting because they're, they're going into somebody else's home that had been defiled. Okay. And God was giving them a sign and a wonder that they could sh- see with their eyes, show to the pre- the priests so they could get to the root of the issue. Wow. And it could be broken, cleansed, and then they could be, they, they won't be cursed. They could get out, you know. So that was kind of an, another interesting story that popped into my head. I don't remember. So there's many, many examples in the Old Testament of God directing them to do that and examples of them doing it properly or not doing it properly. And, and the results and, thereof. You know, I, I keep right. coming back to that verse, my people perish for lack of knowledge, and just how true that is, like not having an understanding of these spiritual laws and the ways of God. And we think that we can do things differently and, and not have those consequences. Um, yeah, you were right. It is, uh, uh, about Jericho. So in Joshua seven, Achan is punished for stealing from the Lord. Um, and it says, uh, the Lord had said that everything in Jericho belonged to him, but Achan from the Judah tribe took some of the things from Jericho for himself so I maybe this wasn't an I was I thought it was like an idol or something he took but but later in the chapter it says he confesses um Joshua says Achan the Lord God of Israel has decided you are guilty tell me what you did and don't try to hide anything and he says it's true I sinned and disobeyed the Lord God while we were in Jericho I saw a beautiful Babylonian robe 200 pieces of silver and a gold bar I wanted them so I took them I don't know if that story in particular, now that you've given more details on it, had to do with the 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 uh, the pagan images, the the other gods on the artifacts. I think it. I think that one had more to do with this was like the first nation or first um, uh, enemy tribe, however you want to word it, that they crossed into the first battle that the Lord gave them victory over. And it was almost like a first fruits. Like not only did he not want the defilement of that practice that was taking place in Jericho to come into the camp, but it was almost like, I'm not letting you have any of the spoils, even spoils that you could have 
because all of this is mine. So basically, destroy it all, leave it alone. I'm going to bless you in other ways in the future as far as spoils are concerned. And it was an act of disobedience because obviously he didn't follow God's direction. But it was like a first fruits offering to the Lord since he had, um, you know, provided that victory for him. So, yeah, I don't know if that one had to do with the idols. Not so much idols, so much just then. disobedience. But but what it's saying right. here, um, so let's see here. Uh, but there was a judgment that happened, a, a, a lack of protection that God had. So um, Joshua sent these spies to Ai, which is east of Bethel. Um, and they say to Joshua, they report back, you don't need to send the whole army. Two or 3,000 troops will be enough. Why bother to send the whole army for a town that small? So Joshua sends 3,000. But the men of Ai fought back and chased the Israelite soldiers away from the town gate. Uh, 36 Israelite soldiers were killed, and the army left d- discouraged. And Joshua and the leaders tore their clothes, put dirt, dirt on their heads to show their sorrow, and lay face down in the ground in front of their sacred che- in front of the sacred chest until sunset. And then Joshua inquires of the Lord. Did you bring us across the Jordan River just so the Amorites could destroy us? And the Lord answers, uh, stop lying on the ground, get up. Uh, I said everything in Jericho belonged to me and had to be destroyed. That's what you you said. Uh, But the Israelites have kept some of the things for themselves. They stole from me and hid what they took, and they lied about it. And so that's that's why they didn't have the victory. So just kind of tying in the... The influence of right. di- disobedience to uh, to God's blessing and protection and all of that. Um, yeah. So this altar, um, he uh, Tim Ben says was eighteen feet by eight inches thick, or I'm sorry, eighteen feet by eight feet thick of granite. Now he doesn't say those. That's two of the dimensions. He doesn't give the third dimension. Um, but we can imagine that. This would be considered a monolith, probably hundreds of tons. So very much in line with the the, the Nephilim construction that we see in these, these different places that we're, we're not sure how they cut these, how they move these things, right? Right. Now, did he um, mention, I don't remember the location, was it the Middle East where he was? Yeah, this was in the Middle East. Okay. And so he's talking about how um, how these altars can have a direct effect on on crime and other problems in the area, like human trafficking and and breaches of a of a country's border. Um, that a lot of these problems can often be tied to this uh, idolatry that's been allowed to to remain, sometimes unknown, you know, under the ground. Um, it basically creates that spiritual environment on the land to give demonic freedom. Um, so again, the archaeologists identified that altar as part of a known Canaanite city, and that's where I I assume that this was a place Israel was pro- probably meant to destroy, but did not. And so it, it makes me wonder: Could this ancient evil have been dealt with thousands of years ago? if they'd have just listened to God's command and continued to carry out what they were supposed to. And yet here it was, you know, in our, in our time, uh, still having evil influence, or at least it did when it was uncovered. That was, that was kind of interesting that it, things, things started to happen. Like he was saying, some of these archeologists were getting sick, um, when they came in contact with this thing. And then I wonder, is our authority as believers limited if we don't deal with altars such as this, as this, you know, that these the, kind of these spiritual laws that we need to be, that we need to be aware of. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting. I don't understand um, the specifics, but you, you mentioned how things got worse when it was uncovered. So um, it, it's almost like when it was covered and hidden and under the dirt or wherever it happened to be, I don't know if the problems were necessarily there 
maybe they were, but it's once it was understood that, okay, this is in your face. Now you got to do something with it. Hmm. Now you're presented with a choice. All right. You know, do you, do you put it in a museum? Do you, uh, you know, cherish it and be very sensitive to it because it's old or do you follow God's directive? And when you choose poorly, there is poor, uh, the, you know, uh, effects, you know, you mentioned them getting sick and other things going on. So yeah, very interesting. They, the archeologists wanted to preserve it as a, as a important artifact of antiquity. You're exactly right. And that's kind of why I brought up those verses about do not desire the gold and silver in them and, and utterly that destroy these, these altars. Yeah. We can't be valuing, valuing something that, uh, that God abhors and is is going to create lots of problems if it's not dealt with pos- uh, biblically. Um, the other thing that's interesting, so I don't want to skip too far ahead of it, but basically there was this little three-year-old kid who has this amazing spiritual gift of intercession and worship and everything, and, and here they have this... Um, this this giant storm cloud come in um, near this altar, and they see like a demonic face, and this little child picks up a stone, almost like David and Goliath, and throws it at the cloud, and they hear like this this shock wave, this sonic boom, like a cracking of a tree, and that was the sign that this um, this altar was spiritually destroyed, and um and then and then the little child starts uh starts praising God because he knows what it what had happened and uh, Tim mentions um our our children as quivers I'm sorry Tim mentions as arrows in our quiver are are our children and it's interesting just how much um spiritual warfare this little child was able to do and you kind of contrast that with you know, we put kids in Sunday school and and give them little uh, you know pictures to 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 color with uh, Noah and the animals and the ark and stuff. And it's like we almost kind of dumb down some of this stuff. And um, and they mention in this interview, you know, just how sensitive children can be to things spiritually that sometimes we we miss. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I think we we fail in that accord. Um, I've I've even heard and I had a friend of mine who had a, a granddaughter this that that was this way when she was very young um she she was very sensitive to the spiritual realm she was getting dreams she was uh, seeing things in the sp- spiritual realm and um and that kind of dissipated as the older she got and the more worldly she got but it was that young age of innocence that uh, she really had that sensitivity. Um, but yeah, if you if you have the wisdom as an adult to train up the children in the in in not limit them because they're a child, but treat them as as uh, as a tool unto the Lord, you know, and the Lord blesses them with spiritual gifts and things like that. Um, yeah, there's no young. There's no age limit on when they can't be effective. You right. Know? Their prayers are just as powerful, you know. Yep. Um, yeah, and so, there's and, and there's things that they can do that sometimes we can't. I can't remember if it was this interview, but I remember hearing about, you know, children going into these, these um, war-torn areas of Africa, you know, going into these uh, enemy tribes that are just violent as can be. And being able to have a spiritual influence and help help talk about the love the love and truth of Jesus there, and the adults definitely wouldn't have been able to to go in there and do that. You know, they would have been killed for sure. But the children were able, were able to go in there and do that. Um, and so they said that once this uh, this altar was broken spiritually, that uh, it, it wasn't long after that it started to crumble. And so it was almost like there was a demonic preservation of this this stone for thousands of years, and then it it started to fall apart. 
and there's a lot of parallels that, that that came to mind when I thought of that. Number one is you think of uh, Lord of the Rings with Gollum, and it says uh, the ring gave Gollum unnatural long life, right? And um, or I think of uh, uh, William Schneblum, um, who used to be a Satanist, and how he. According to him, he says he lived on nothing but blood for a whole year. So there was a demonic preservation that was going on that once that power was broken, the stone started to crumble. Um, and Tim also gets into this idea of uh, boundaries. that, And this is what I, I, I kind of phrase it as, that not all sin is equal. That, that, you know, like he brings up the sin of rape. Like before it's a sexual sin, it's a boundaries sin. It's a, it's, it's, you're willing to cross uh, a boundary that, that should be in place. And, and, and so I think both uh, Tim and Rob Skiba were, um, were suggesting kind of where I'm leaning as far as how did the Nephilim resurgence happen through likely uh, Ham's son Canaan that Noah cursed after Ham's sin. So Ham broke a boundary, um, you know, not just a sin, but he actually crossed a boundary. And and I think that's where, you know, we're talking about these Nephilim traits and being a host. That's where you're like willingly opening yourself up and you just shake your fist at God and say, I don't care. Uh, I'm going to do what I want. Yeah, and I think uh, Dr. Laura Sangler, um, she, uh, even though this is just a hypothesis on her part, um, definitely not a official clinical diagnosis or anything uh, as far as classification of a Nephilim host, but um, the types of sins that she documents in her book um, that if someone willfully does these things, you're just, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, you're opening yourself up to a, it's not just a baby lie. It's not just a little, a little act. I mean, it is, like you said, premeditated, um, and uh, deep, deeper qu- uh, consequences, uh, lie there, you know, when you commit some of these things. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's where, that's where I kind of agree with, with that idea of, uh, of, uh, the Nephilim returning through Ham's son, Canaan. Um, and of course, Dr. Laura talks about, you know, epigenetics and, and, uh, having a, a, basically a genetic trait that can be turned on and off as, as epigenetics, the study of is, is uncovering. And so there may have been a recessive trait that uh, genetically that maybe Ham's wife had. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know if I really agree with that one, that theory. Um, I mean, it, it's an in- interesting hypothesis. I almost wonder if it's if it's not so much a dormant gene, but as we know, when we're we're of the lineage all of humanity is of the lineage of of adam and eve so once that initial sin curse is in our genetics is in our bloodline we're born into it that's where we're we are, we're in need of a savior from the time we're born so we're already predisposed to go you don't have to teach a child to lie sure or you know have bad behavior yeah you know it's in their character to to do the wrong things and but by our free will coupled with that i think that's what leads to these things i don't i don't know that i I really agree that it's a hidden uh dna type of thing turning on turning off i think it's more if you willfully do evil sinful and like you were saying there's levels to the severity of the consequences of certain sin. Um, like Dr. Laura says, talking about trafficking of humans or uh, eating of, of human flesh, cannibalism, right. blood, that type of, you know, murder, you know, these 
really, really, and I think even Pastor Doug Riggs talked about Hitler on how he qualified to reach a certain level, almost like a Nephilim host, okay, because of his willful blood of the, the willful evil that he did. So it wasn't a genetic thing. It was it was the iniquity force that he was willing to do. He received additional power, evil yeah. power. No, I, I would agree with that. And, and I think, um, yeah, we can't be too dogmatic about it and say, oh, so-and-so had a, you know, Nephilim DNA, therefore they can't be saved. Or, or, you know, therefore they're going to be super evil or something like that. Yeah, it's a willingness of your, of your spirit to, to involve. And, and, and even, you know, uh, some of the Blurry Creatures episodes talking about shapeshifters where, where the initiation of that is um, that killing has to take place. There's a blood sacrifice that has to take place. So, yeah, I think, I think that willingness of one's spirit, um, perhaps independent of DNA is, is, is the main issue, but I'm referring to more of the, um, the genetic line of Nephilim of the, the human angel hybridization that perhaps was evident because, because we're talking about, again, you know, these Canaanite tribes that were of great stature and strength. So it was it wasn't merely their iniquity and their evil, right? There was also physical qualities that normal human G- DNA doesn't possess. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and and obviously the scripture talks about Nimrod. So if you're talking about the 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 cursed line of of Ham, which and in turn ended up being the Canaanites, um which led to Nimrod and that the scripture says he be Began to be something different. Yeah, a Gabor. So, so is it possible that he was fully human, but he his his generation, his family tree, was cursed? It was, there was a, a verbal curse that that Noah did on the the offspring. Plus, there's the iniquity force of this sin from passed on, because it talks about the sins of the forefathers being passed on that if the sin has not been dealt with and you continue to so so m- generations before me committed certain sins and then nobody deals with the sin and the acts and the evil just gets greater and greater and greater and now it's built up to to my choice and my free wills and maybe that's when if i'm willing to participate in all of that and not deal with the generational stuff and have my own free will that's that's committing evil maybe genetically i could potentially change into something different um even on a molecular cellular dna level that's what appears took place with Nimrod. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a viable um, hypothesis. Yeah, I, but I also, again, like I said, I also wonder if it's, it's sometimes it's both. It's both the, it's both the iniquity that you're willing to push, put yourself in, but then in some cases there's also actually that, that passed on DNA that there's, that's there too. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, so in, in, kind of the general sense like these sin issues can persist when these altars are not dealt with and the idolatry has the ability to permeate the atmosphere of a geographic region and the people of that region um and so a lot of times like we said when there's major problems in the world with sin and evil it's often associated with idolatry and so when god was driving out the nephilim from these lands it was not just about judgment it was about restoring that land that had been defiled. And so uh, Rob Skiba mentions um, seeing an animation of showing uh, world wars throughout the history. And the, the animation on the world map was showing like little explosions where wars were happening. And if, and if it was a bigger war, it would show a bigger explosion in the animation. 
And he said it was incredible how many of these things were happening in the area that's now Germany. Um, and so what's interesting is that when these giant tribes, the Nephilim tribes, were being um, driven out of the land, because not all of them were killed, but a lot of times they were driven out from the lands that uh, the Israelites were being given by God, uh, many of them did settle in Germany. And that might be why Germany was in, is so um, involved in world wars and the uh, atrocities that were committed there was because of, of a lot of these. Uh, and I believe Tim Bentz um, says that he, he knew of at least 12 uh, Canaanite altars. And he, at the time of the interview with Rob, he said he had dealt with three of them, destroyed three of them. But there was at least 12 that he had identified. Yeah, that's interesting to, uh, to, to, to wonder where did they all go? I think L.A. Mazzulli had found some some writing on an artifact in Ohio or someplace in here in the States, you know, that that made reference to the Canaanites. And I know we haven't got into it yet, and we probably will, because um, it was in that that interview about Jekyll Island. So that's off the coast of Georgia. So here in the States, Canaanite um, connection. Um, I think didn't he mention also speak going back to Germany? Um, and it's kind of interesting if you think of Indiana Jones and the <laughs> uh, the, the the Lost Ark episode. Yep. They were desiring some ancient artifacts, which it happened to be the, the Ark of the Covenant, in in the goal of empowering their armies. So even though it was that, I mean, change the narrative to a, a Canaanite ar- uh, altar, which I think Tim referenced that before World War II, there was some altars that were maybe shipped in you know, brought brought to Berlin. Yes. Good good segue. I was just going to get to there. Um, the seed of Satan, or an altar of Zeus, is, is often been called the seed of Satan. And in the book of Revelation, it talks about this in Pergamum, which I guess is in Turkey. <clears throat> but uh, I was able to pull up an article because, yeah, Tim and Rob uh, do talk a little bit about this. Um, so let me just grab this article i found that talks a little bit about it so yeah and didn't um, they say there was one um that was in berlin that um was replicated by obama or brought in by obama President yeah obama? yeah so um that is correct so satan's throne moved to berlin so you have the ancient city of pergamum um which was in turkey and then, uh, let's see, it was one of the most uh, influential cities of the Roman Empire and a center of uh, worship for the Roman emperor, who is believed to be part god and part human. So there we have the demigods of, uh, of Nephilim descent. Uh, there was a temple for worshiping the war god Athena, or war, war goddess, uh, but most important, an altar in the city was the great altar of Zeus, which is mentioned as the throne of Satan in the book of Revelation. Uh, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And so, okay, here we go. In 1878, the German engineer Karl Hummann, I don't know why I said Hummann, Karl Hummann started to dismantle the altar of Zeus from uh, the long abandoned city of Pergamum and took it to Berlin. The altar was really? sto- was stored until the building of a new museum in Berlin started in 1910. Well, how about that? World War I started not long after, right? Due to right. war and economic depression in Germany, the museum was not open for visitors until 1930. And of course, if you know a little bit about World War I, uh, the the peace deal that Germany was forced to make because they were getting whooped, um, basically left their country economically devastated. That's where you have the the hyperinflation of Weimar Germany, right? Where you had like a wheelbarrow full of 
of marks and it could barely buy a loaf of bread. Yeah, they were they were devastated and so that was the the situation that was ripe for a charismatic leader like Hitler to come to power. Which incidentally the US helped helped finance. <laughs> Not to go down that rabbit trail too much, but uh yeah. Um, the great altar of Zeus, or the throne of Satan, that some people call it, went on display in Berlin's Pergamum uh, Museum in 1930 with the reconstruction of the Ishtar Gate of ancient Bam- Babylon. The Ishtar Gate is also known as the Gates of Hell. Ah, oh, just incredible, these ties. So, Well, and, and as we've heard before, not, not just dealing with the... Um, the altars, which maybe the occultic practice that is known by Hitler and the Nazi power um, that they were uh, practicing in, it makes you wonder, were they doing those things in connection with or around those certain altars that they brought into yes. the nation? ritually. So uh, Tim does mention that. Let me see if I can find it here. Mm, okay, so there was an altar of the Black Sun in Germany, and they said that this is where the Nazi officers, you, they used this location of the altar of the Black Sun as the location for their officers, the SS officers' initiation. So the, Oh, know, that, that's the one that he was talking about that was basically a, a, a castle was built on top of it. Oh, sure. Yep. And yes, the SS were initiated um, some kind of manner. However, yeah. they did that. Yeah. They made oath, oaths and stuff. Incredible, just like we were talking about, willingness uh, to cross boundaries. But there was also, evil. I mean, if you, if you were to go this path, uh, by them participating and making covenant with the darkness... Um, that they did, which are tied to these altars, which are tied to their occultic practices, uh, they literally were opening up portals. They were making exchanges with with uh, with powers that they didn't realize that they couldn't control, and they they part of the benefit that they received was cutting edge technology. You know. That that explains in part why they were so far advanced. The rest of the world is because they were willing to basically sell their souls in exchange for this technology. And um, and as we know that after the war with Operation Paperclip, some of those same researchers, Nazi you know, officers, scat- yeah. Yep, got scattered around the world, even into the United States and the NASA projects. And yep, and form, form so NASA, it, it, CIA. So it's it's far reaching, um, and it definitely didn't end at World War II. And but to to hear how Tim was used to the Lord to strategically go to different places on the planet and find these altars and to fulfill his mandate that you described in Deuteronomy um, is re- was such a powerful interview. Uh, probably one of the best I've heard in a while. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, I'm going to keep trying to find him online because I just, like I said, there's another guy with his name and that's all that pops up when I search for him. So I don't know if he's even still around. Yeah, so he's he's dealing with these altars over in the Middle East and Germany. Um, I think there was one in Germany that he talks about where there was a group of witches that were that's that said publicly they were going to travel there to this altar and they were going to invite the ancient gods to come back (laughs) and uh, that was an interesting story yep and tim and his uh his fellow christians over there uh basically said to them in no uncertain terms yeah not only don't do this because you're going to bring judgment on the land but in the name of god no like you are not allowed and uh and there was, uh, and and they they replied, "Oh no, we come in peace, and this will be good." And and all they're trying to make it sound like it was a, a beneficial thing. And 
Then at some point there was like one of them that was uh, encouraging another witch to say, hey, you've got to go do this. you got to get this done. And so then that one got sent there. And Tim says that she developed health issues when she tried to go there and do this, you know, incantation or whatever. And she almost died. And I think I think it said that they met with her in the hospital and talked to her about it. And she didn't like convert to Christianity or anything at that point, but she realized what she was doing was against God, and she, and she repented and said, "Okay, I'm not going back." Um, yeah, yeah. They they even prayed for her, uh, right, for her healing and and for her soul and everything. Yeah. So, so um, people don't know what they're messing with. But then you see, um, so Tim, I think, said he was overseas for maybe three months, and then he came back to the States, um, and he was pretty wiped out and missing his family, and um, and that's where God says, hey, I've got one more assignment for you. I need you to go to Jekyll Island, Georgia. And he's like, "What? what is there, Lord? I know I'm, I'm pretty tired, but... Um, and God's telling him, this is this the timing of this is important. I need you to do this one more thing and and uh we're kind of running out of time for uh for this episode um so we'll save a lot of this for next time, but let's just start by saying he he goes down to to Georgia, he goes to Jekyll Island, and he doesn't know a whole lot of the history like he knows some of the financial ties to our 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 banking system uh, from there uh, at this point, but he doesn't know a whole lot of the history and he certainly doesn't know why he's being sent down there. And so he has a very interesting interaction with um, the lady at the the hotel there. And she says, are you Tim? And, and she's able to, to figure out that he was the last guy to check in that day. So she knew she was expecting him. But she, she had this feeling like she wanted to say something more, and Tim kind of prodded it out of her, and that's where they kind of figured out that hey, you know, I I felt like I was supposed to give you a couple nights here. I booked you a second night for free, and I set up a meet a meeting with this uh, museum curator, uh, the museum that we have here on Jekyll Island, and you can spend almost the whole day with him tomorrow. And, um, and that's where it gets really interesting, uh, is, uh, talking. So yeah. I, I just want to, uh, to, to say this. So Tim, obviously as a, as a man of God is a, uh, a sensitive spiritual man of God walking in obedience. He was getting, um, he was getting directions from the Lord, which was really, really cool to, to partner with with the Lord in that regard. Now, now you're right in, in describing the story, the, the woman at the, the counter there at the hotel as a, she was a believer, but maybe hadn't exercised that, that gifting, that sensitivity to, to know um, that the Lord is speaking to her, but she was a, 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 a pawn that the Lord used to direct him steps and very, very interesting that, that she did. And I, one of the things that you didn't say, which if people were to listen to the, the interview, it's, it's definitely a must listen to hear it from their mouths, from his mouth, um, all the details. But uh, the key part was, remember what room she put him in? Oh, right. The presidential suite that had just been remodeled. No president, nobody had used that room since the back in the, the early 1900s, right? And a president was there. But the fact that here is the servant of the Lord representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords here on this planet being given the presidential suite. suite. So it was like, I don't, I, I don't think he ever said there was, I, w- I was waiting for, there's something hidden in that room. Like there's something artifact. You oh, know? right. <laughs> but it, was, it, was, it wasn't so much what was in the room. It was the Lord honoring him as a servant. Yeah. As an ambassador. You know. Yeah. As an ambassador to the king of himself, kings. Right. You know, the king of kings and giving him. And she's like, 
are, you don't look presidential. I, I looked you up. I don't, I don't know that you have represent any countries. Like I represent a country, you know, <laughs> that you know, not of. Yes. You know, something beyond. So I thought that, yeah. So I thought that was like an extra little blessing, um, that the Lord gave him, but also, uh, let him know it. He was, you know, being used just another little something. I don't know. I like that. The, pre- the, pre- the presidential suite. I agree. I think that was, that was a, a blessing for his faithfulness in, in responding to God. And, uh, and we see that pattern in scripture too, when, you know, things are, aren't always spelled out, but, but people are faithful to the revelation that God gives them and they walk through that door to greater revelation. So, uh, yeah, why don't we wrap up, uh, today? We'll call this part one. How about, and, um, we will get into the mysteries of Jekyll Island and how that connects to uh, the Federal Reserve and Canaanite altars. So we'll kind of save that as a little bit of a teaser for next time since we laid the groundwork for the kind of the spiritual significance of um, these altars and the willingness to um, break boundaries uh, towards sin and how that invites uh, spiritual powers, and uh, and how uh, Tim was used of God to to deal with that, and how it ties into our uh, our modern day banking system, and um, really, there's also some really interesting history that uh, Dr. Laura Sanger brings up uh, with Jekyll Island, uh, having to do with slavery, and so there's a lot of correlation between you know our banking system, debt. And slavery; those things are are very connected uh, in God's eyes, as far as how he how he sees those. So, wrap it up for now. Yep. Excellent. Well, we'll get into part two next week, and we'll see if Don can join us then, and we'll continue on. Sounds good. It'll work. All right. Talk to you later. been listening to the days of noah podcast thanks for tuning in again today don't forget to like share and subscribe pass it along to your family and friends to help grow the channel don't forget to come back next week as we pick it up with part two of tim benz's story and how he dealt with canaanite altars right here in the usa in jekyll island georgia and how that was the birthplace of our very own Federal Reserve Banking System. As always, feel free to reach out to us at the Days of Noah Podcast at gmail.com with any questions, comments, or ideas or suggestions for the show. We appreciate each and every one of you listening, so thanks for just being a part of this journey with us. God bless and see you next week.